with a world that is literally going to hell in a handbasket. It doesn't look good. There doesn't seem to be any good. The world is a mess. Am I right? The world's a mess. There's nothing good about it. When we look at the the news, when we watch the television, when we go on the internet and look at the things that are happening, there's no good news. There really isn't. It's full of pain. The world is full of suffering. The world is full of uh, hunger and death, natural disasters, and the worst kind, human disasters, mass murders, sexual abuse, all the way down to kids, drug addictions that are totally encompassing whole cities. If you read the news, and I haven't even gotten to the wars yet, not even to the wars. The world is a mess. The world is a mess, and you look at all of the the things that are going on that are negative in the world and its repercussions, and honestly, you want to throw up your hands and cry out, how can a good God let these kinds of things happen? Have you asked yourself that question? Have you thrown it up to God yourself? If you haven't, then you're not breathing. You're not breathing. Because there's not a one of us that doesn't look at the world and wonder, God, well, why did you let this happen? Why are these kinds of things going on? Now, the psalmist acknowledges this truth. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to look at Psalm 27, verse 13. Psalm 27, verse 13. And the psalmist, and uh, we don't know, and and by the way, I want to tell you a little bit about psalms so that you know. If you look at Psalm 27 on the very top of it, in little bitty writing, they call that superscript, okay? In little bitty writing, uh, it says in most Bibles, a psalm of David or of David. It depends on... Uh, you know, what version you have. You see that, everybody? Um, That's actually not a part of the psalm in English, but it is a part of the psalm in Hebrew. It's the very first verse. And um, that's uh, that's called part of the Masorah, which is where we get the Hebrew Masoretic text from, which came about in about 90 A.D. is when it it basically got uh, culminated. And uh, that is probably from historical oral tradition that, oh, that psalm was from David. Okay? So you know. But the bottom line is this. Whoever wrote this, whether it was David or, or not, it's in the Bible. And Psalm 27, as it's dealing with Uh, uh, the concept of a fearless trust in God himself. It says in verse 13, what we're all thinking about the world, and that it says, I would have despaired. I would have been bummed out in the terminology of the late 60s and 70s. I would have been bummed out if I would not have seen or believed or would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Somehow, the psalmist understood the world is a mess. David looked at it and said, it's a mess. And David was really good about making messes, you know, right? He was really good about making messes. And he knew what it was like to make a mess. And he said, I would have despaired. I would have despaired, except I know something else. Yes, we live in a fallen world, and yet there is still hope in God and His goodness. But when sin came in, good, real good, went out. Now, that may be hard for us to understand because we can still see good on the earth. We really can. There there are pockets of it. But in the deepest spiritual, godlike goodness, when sin came in, all good on the earth 
was tossed. And folks, what we need to understand is that is one reason why, as we live in that fallen world, that we find things like what we saw in the video and what we find in the news and what we see with our own eyes. That a fallen world doesn't know how to do things very well. And human beings, when we get involved in it, in our sinful natures, make it even worse. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans, which is in the New Testament, book of Romans chapter 3. Because in, in Romans chapter 3, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us what the human condition is like without God. And by the way, if you, if you don't know this, just because you're born on the earth doesn't mean that you know God. You know that, right? We Baptists are really good about that part. We understand the fact that there has to be some sort of transaction that has taken place. You are just not a Christian because you're born in a Christian home. You're not a Christian because your mommy and daddy took you to a Christian church. You're not a Christian because somehow, some way, grandma prayed for you into heaven. It doesn't work that way. Does everybody understand that? Without Jesus Christ... And without you making a decision for him, in other words, saying yes to him and having him come into your life and transforming you, you are woefully lost. There is no good in you. There's not even a good person on the earth without Jesus Christ. Now, we may look at that and and go, well, wait a minute. My grandma was really good, okay? And I don't know why I go into southern accent when I say stupid stuff, okay? (laughs) But the, but the truth is, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, you're not good. You know how I know that? Look what it says in Romans chapter 3, and it's on the screen, I believe it is. Okay? What then, verse 9 says, are we better than they, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, which, by the way, encompasses the whole earth, everybody, Not at all, Paul says, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Does everybody got that? We're all under sin. As it is written in verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. You see that? None that does good. There is not even one. And i got to tell you, I, I can read the Greek manuscript, so I, I understand. Do you know how emphatic that is? It's saying there's not even one. Don't you even think about it. There's not one person who is a good person who's walking on the face of the earth without Jesus Christ. we got to get that in our skulls. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And I would suggest to you that that sounds like a, uh, a bad recipe, doesn't it? The world is a mess because it doesn't have a Savior that they have asked to come in and transform their lives. Only Jesus can do that. And you can try to do good all you like by yourself, and it is impossible. And one of the things that I think is a a critical thing in this, it talks about the fear of God. You know, a lot of people have a problem with that, and so they, they say, well, it's reverent awe. I'm sorry, folks. Do you know what it says in Greek? It uses the word phobos. The word phobos in Greek means fear. Like, ah! And I've got to tell you something. If you know how powerful something really is, you understand that fear. An electrician understands the power of electricity and doesn't play with it. Do you know that there were were two guys, uh, Nadab and Abihu, who played with the power of God? Did you remember that story? It's in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10, if I remember right. And you know what? God slew them in their priestly, priestly robes on the very day they were dedicating the tabernacle of God. Oh, my goodness. Why? Because they did not fear him. 
We need to understand. And we need to understand, you know, I don't understand the, the concept of a loving God and, and this, you know, yes, it's reverential awe, but, it, awe, but it's also absolute fear of the, of the creator God who has the power to take you and snuff you out if he, if he wanted to. Thank God he doesn't. He doesn't. But the world is a mess because they don't recognize that. And there's not any of us that is good. So what about God's goodness? What about God's goodness? Because honestly, I've sat there sometimes and wondered, how could that have happened? How can this, the, you know, this, this innocent child or whatever it might be just have to undergo such atrocities? How can this, how can this school undergo such someone walking in and killing all of these students? How can, how can they walk into a church and just start shooting people because they don't like, they don't like them? Or how can good Christian people go into a mosque and kill people too? How about that? We, let's, not, let's not play with this, folks. The world is messed up. But God is good. At least that's what I heard. The goodness of God. Now, believe it or not, we're in a series right now on the fruits of the Spirit. And I'm continuing with that. And I, I was given... The, the part in Galatians chapter 5, can you put that on the screen, please? Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Let's recite that because we've been doing that all the time. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law that's what we've been studying and and uh, pastor john said jp would you do um kindness and so i started doing my study on the word kindness and everything and you know what i found out kindness and goodness are almost the same thing i would challenge anybody here to give me a, di a different definition of those two things. And yet they are different, and the difference is very subtle. And so I asked Pastor John, I said, would you mind if I did two of them? And he said, well, that's all right. Is, is the sermon going to be twice as long? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> okay, absolutely. And so, so he said, okay, let's, let's do that. So, so I started looking at those two words. Before we go anywhere, folks, as we look at that passage in Galatians, and one of the things that is, that is incredible to me about that passage, and one of the things that, um, that we need to get is that when, when Paul was writing this to the Galatians, he asked them in chapter 5 to be you know, to be imitators of Christ and, and to be imitators of God as beloved children and, and looking what God has and trying to imitate it. But then he says, you know what? Don't do this other stuff because you guys have to understand that you're biting and devouring one another because all you want to do is your own thing. And he goes and gives a list of all the, the fleshly things that we're all about. And I'm going to tell you, it, it's not good. The list is, is really horrible when you look at it right before. He says, he says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And then it goes on to say later on in, in that passage, I'm in Ephesians, that's the wrong one. That ain't going to work, okay? In Galatians, he says, you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into opportunity of the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Do you know what the problem in the church is? People. That's the problem in the church. I don't know about you, but I'm a person. How about you? And if we, because we get all into what we want and how we want it, and we get, it's all about us. And then when we were relating with people, I don't like the way they walk. <laughs> well, he had a knee replacement. He's got a limp. Well, I still don't like it. I don't like the way that they talk. I don't like the way they look at me. 
They have a wandering eye. What are you supposed to do with that? Okay? I'm serious. And people do that. And I, I've, I've worked in churches. I've been a pastor for 36 years. And can I tell you something? Don't fool yourself. It happens in church all the time. All the time. Paul didn't write this idly because he saw it in the church in Galatia. He said that they were doing that stuff. But we've been given something different, and the goodness of God is all about that. If you don't have Christ, you can't have the things that we've been talking about. If you don't have Christ, you can't love with God's love. If you don't have Christ, you really can't have patience. If you don't have Christ, you cannot be kind. If you don't have Christ, you won't be good. It is impossible for that to happen. In fact, the Bible tells us really clearly Without Christ, that you, without his Holy Spirit indwelling in us, it's impossible to love. How do I know that? Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says this. It says, it says that without, um, without the Holy Spirit, we're, it is absolutely impossible to love because it says that, that we have been given hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God, listen, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given unto us. So without God's Holy Spirit, without Jesus Christ in us and living through his Holy Spirit, it is impossible to even love the world. Impossible. And so if you don't have Christ, you can't have any of these things. Not one of them. But the ones we're looking at today are kindness and goodness. They're right in that list. Kindness and goodness. Now, the Greek word for kindness is krestates. Krestates. And it is the concept of meeting a real need God's way. Okay? Meeting a real need God's way. In other words, it is doing what is right, no matter what the circumstances are, for another person's benefit. And it, it is... A, a very interesting word because um, there are some commentators that believe that the word that would mean uh, um, the kind people sounds very much like Christian people and that they used to um, play on words with the early Christians because they would, they would call themselves Christians or little Christ or little anointed ones and people that didn't like them call them, you know, the little goody two-shoes because it sounded just the same. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But when we look at that word, the idea is, is doing what is right. The Bible really clearly says, as we, we saw in Romans chapter 12, it says there is none that it does good. There's not anyone who is good. No, not even one. And the word for good there is the same word. Christates. There's not any, any that do it without empowering of God. The second word that we have today is the word goodness. Now, the the word goodness comes from the word for good in uh, Greek, which is agathos. The the, uh, Greek word for goodness is uh, um, agathos sune. And uh, it is the idea of an intrinsic good. In other words, it is It is the good that you get when God transforms you and you are good because you have been justified by Jesus Christ. There is no longer any condemnation for you and that good makes you good whether you're bad even. Does that make sense? And it's the thing that says if Jesus has come into your life and has transformed you, then you are good on paper legally. Does that make sense? You have the document that says, I'm good, even though you can act bad. And I don't know if, if you had this experience as a believer, but um, unfortunately, uh, good Christians, because Jesus does that and transforms them, can act bad. You know that, okay? And it's one of the reasons why Paul wrote Galatians 5 in particular, because we've got to treat each other a little bit nicer and give each other some slack, Okay? But that goodness is the, the goodness that comes from God. In fact, that, that word is not found in... If you look back in the, in the first century in the Greek language, it is not found in any secular writings whatsoever. Christians made up the word because it's a Christian word that talks about 
how God has transformed us from the inside. And intrinsically, part of who we are as, as our new creation is that we are good, even though we may act bad. Okay? And this is a really important concept that we have. Uh, it is the idea of a spiritual and moral excellence that has been given to us by God's Holy Spirit. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. I think we have it on the screen. And he said to them, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. You know the story. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and and asks him that question. Well, the, the bottom line is this. What Jesus is saying is there is only one who is good, and the word good there is the word agathos, which is the basis for the word that we're having here. What he's trying to say is this. He said, oh, there's only one good. It's God. God is the only good one. And the goodness that God gives us is our heritage in Jesus Christ. It's what it's about. You can also see it in in 3 John uh, chapter 1, verse 11. By the way, there's only one chapter in 3 John, just so so some of you like to know. Okay. Now, I want to, I, you know, This whole thing about kindness and goodness is a two-edged sword. It really is. Because the, the idea is that God has made us good people by his grace. And he wants us to do good things by his power. And that's the two-edged sword in all of this. Uh, Her name was Alicia de Martinez. I don't remember what her actual family name was. She was a a lady that was married to Sadi Martinez in Uruguay. They lived in the town of Mercedes, Uruguay. Uh, They were the caretakers of El Mirador, which was a um, farm that I found myself having to be the administrator of It was a farm that Baptists had purchased and was using to help out the local people and uh, showing them how to grow food. And we had an an agronomist who was a missionary teaching them how to to grow things. One of the great things they grew was strawberries. It was awesome. They had 400 peach trees. Can you imagine? Peaches all the time. It was really great. And, um, And then they also had a dairy uh, they had 30, 30 cows, and they, they, uh, they milked uh, the cows and had that dairy. And we had those, the caretakers. Um, when that missionary went off, uh, they called the closest missionary to be the administrator, and it happened to be me. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, California. Um, I didn't even know which end of a cow to milk, to be perfectly honest with you. And I had no idea how to grow anything, okay, except for hair, because, you know, just Southern California boy. And it was, it was, I honestly learned so much. I learned how to run a dairy in Spanish. Don't ask me what the words are in English. I know how to do it in Spanish. But I met this couple, Sadi Martinez and Alicia de Martinez, his wife. One time they, they asked me to, you know, uh, to, to lunch, and uh, like country people everywhere, what's the biggest meal? It's lunch, isn't it? Because you've got to fuel up to get back out to the fields and do it. And that, they were exactly the same. And then they had a passel of kids. I'm, they had like six kids. I couldn't, and two of them were twins. You know, it was, it was, it was a great family. Uh, I loved them. And uh, I remember uh, going to the, the farm, and they invited me to eat. And um, I really wanted to be that missionary that loved them, was good to them, encouraged them to demonstrate these two words of kindness and goodness. Um, During that period of time when I was doing that, they had a uh, really bad epidemic of typhoid fever. Does anybody know what typhoid fever is? Uh, It basically is when you're not cleaning your utensils right and you get you know, uh, bad material on the, your plates. And, and, and you know, it's just not a, it's a cleanliness issue. And um, in their neighborhood and the water they were using, they, they had to be really careful of it. So the mission president said, now, John, when you go up there, you got to be really careful. So, you know, because you don't know what, you got to make sure they're really cleaning the, the utensils and whatnot. Because these people were very humble people, okay, living on this farm. So I went and, and they, uh, 
they set the table and like, you know, every farm family ever that, man, there was a lot of food and everything. It was, and they set me down there. I was at the head of the table and Alicia's over there cooking and, and Sadi's over there, the dad and the, all the kids are sitting down. And uh, Uruguayans don't use napkins. They just don't. It's just sort of, you know, like that, okay? It's just, that's just how it is when you get out in the country. And so I'm sitting there and I look down at the, at the uh, table and I look at the fork and my fork had a, like a green thing on it, okay? And it didn't look pretty. And it looked moist on top of it. And I'm like, oh. Now, don't ask me how I knew it was green because I'm red-green colorblind. It just looked green. It had to be green. And I looked down at that and I went, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And you know what in my, went in my head? Typhoid fever is going around here. You better be careful. You could die if you put that in your mouth. I'm not kidding you. That's what happened. I started, I started thinking all those things, and then I had this other voice in my head say, but wait a minute. God has called you here as a missionary. You've got to be. These people will feel bad if you say, oh, I got a dirty fork here, you know, because, I mean, they had enough forks for everybody to have one and no more. I mean, you know, we could go in the drawer and pull out more. They had like a fork for everybody, and that was it. And I looked down at that fork, and I went, ha-ha. When they pray, with every eye closed and every head bowed, I'm going to take that fork, and I'm going to clean it off on my pants, okay? And, and I'll take care of it that way. And then uh, Sadi, Sadi said to me, uh, uh, Brother John, why don't you lead us in prayer? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, you know what? When you're talking in Spanish and just talking about soccer and how the farm's going and the gospel and things like that, it's easy. But when you have to pray, you, have, you talk different. ISIS, isn't that the truth? You talk different. There's a different language, okay? And I'm like, oh my goodness. And all I knew how to do at that point, because I was a pretty new missionary, was to say, gracias, Señor, por, thank you, thank you, Lord, for, and then just a list. You know, I would just make a list. Thank you, God, for the sun. Thank you for the dog outside. Thank you for, you know, all that. You know, I just do a list. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness. So I asked everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes, and then I was looking to make sure. And uh, I grabbed the fork and I start praying, you know, gracias, Señor, por, por el cielo, por la, este, por la comida. Por, you know, and I'm, I'm talking, making the list, and I'm starting to try to clean it off. But I was also wanting to watch them to make sure nobody's looking because I didn't want to embarrass them. I wanted to be kind to them and love them and be good toward them. And I'm, I'm sitting there and doing this, and I get done, I go, amen, I put it back down, and guess what's still on the fork? The green thing is still on the fork, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So I sat there, and everyone dove in, and they're eating heartily because, man, they got to go back out and deal with the cows, and they got, you know, all that stuff, and I'm just sitting there. And Sadi, the, the dad, turns to me, and he says, Brother John, is there something wrong with the food? You get it? Is there something wrong with the food? And I went, oh, God, I'm going to die for Jesus, aren't I? I'm going to die, and they're going to bury me here in Uruguay. My father will never see me again. (laughs) I said, okay, Lord, you called me. I mean, this is all in a nanosecond. God, you called me. So I figured that you want me to keep serving these people, and I know you want me to love them, to be kind to them, and not embarrass them or anything. So God, I'm going to stick that fork in my mouth, and I'm asking you, Lord, protect me from the typhoid fever and all of that stuff. And so so I said, okay, no, no, Brother Sadi, it's great. Thank you so much. I was just sort of taking it all in, you know. And so I got the fork. I stuck it in the, the, they had made pizza, homemade pizza. It was really good. So I got it, you know, I cut it. <clears throat> stuck it in my mouth. No, and I, was, I, I shoveled it down as fast as I could so I wouldn't taste anything funny. You know, I just ate it really fast. And then I put the fork down and, oh, thank you, God. And then uh, the wife is picking up the plates and stuff when we were all done, Alicia, and she was the sweetest gal ever. She goes, oh, uh, Hermano Juan, Brother John, she says, would you like some more? And she'd already taken my plate up and taken my the fork up the only other fork up. And I said, oh, Alicia, I would love some more. And she said, oh, here. And she puts a, she puts a, a new plate. She had one more plate 
put the plate down, and then she said, oh, que bobo, que sos, soy, okay, which, what a dummy I am in Spanish, you know, that's what she said to, out loud, I took your fork, well, she put it in the dirty water, and I mean dirty water, and I went, oh, and I'm thinking pizza at home, right, and the, and the dad goes, oh, Alicia, I can't believe you did that, and then he grabs his fork, puts it in his mouth, cleans it off, and says, Brother John, use mine. And I looked at that fork, and I said, oh God, I'm going to die for Jesus. (laughs) But if I wouldn't have taken that fork, if I wouldn't have put the other one in my mouth, I would not have demonstrated the goodness that God put in me that was not there before and the kindness to give them respect as humble as they were living. He's called us to that, each and every one of us, that we have honest goodness in our hearts with honest actions towards those who are around us. It's not like fake news or fake goodness. The Bible says in in, uh, Proverbs 27, 6, did I put that on there? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. How many of you have been hurt by somebody that just was nice to you, but it was fake? And how many of you have been hurt by the wounds of your friend who was actually telling you the truth and loving you with the truth, and you got mad at him. You see, the, the truth about goodness and kindness is that we're going to be honest with that and those that we serve that are around us and not just run over it. We cannot have fake goodness. We cannot have fake kindness. It is not in harmony with our God. So what is God's plan? Because I want to know. God, the earth is messed up. And I know that you said that you have kindness and goodness and we're supposed to demonstrate it with honesty, but God, what's your plan? The psalmist said it clearly. I would have despaired unless I had seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying I see hope in God. I see God's goodness. I see him working. I know that it's possible And so I believe that God's plan is this, to inject goodness and kindness, his goodness, his kindness, into a fallen world in his followers, in his church, in you, and in me. That's God's plan. And you know how I know it? Because God's plan works like this. This is God's work. First off, He changes lives. John 3.16 God so loved the world that what? His only begotten son that what? That anyone that what? Should not have what? But have what instead? Everlasting life. Do you know what's going on? God says you're messed up. You need a savior. And the only way that you're going to get a Savior is not from amongst yourselves. I've got to come down and take care of it for you. And God is about changing lives. So the first thing in the step of of God's plan is changing lives. The second part of that is that he empowers lives. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. One of my favorite favorite verses because it basically tells us our marching orders in a sense of action as believers as the church it says this but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in jerusalem in all judea and samaria and even to the remotest parts of arizona like nogales (laughs) or yuma Okay? (laughs) Empowered lives by God's Holy Spirit. Yes, He changes our lives. He makes us good when we weren't good. He transforms us into eternal beings in the sense of living forever with Him rather than living forever in death. And He empowers us for the here and the now to be what He's called us to be, 
witnesses. The word martyr or martyrus is the word for a witness. And it is the idea of one who tells the truth about what they know. And that's what we've been called to be, is witnesses, empowered, changed because of God's plan. And then we, he gives us purposeful lives. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I can't remember. Did I put that on the... No, I did not. Okay, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Okay, I want you to listen to this. And you've heard it a gazillion times. If you've, ever, if you've been to church at all, you've heard it a gazillion times. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jewel made a statement earlier that was very interesting. She said, she said, you know, as a church, we go and build houses, and we did that, and that's a good thing, but the greatest thing that we can do is share the gospel. I'm going to tell you it is, but if we neglect the other, then giving the gospel is going to look like something else. It's going to look like we want a notch in our Bibles and that we don't really want to see their lives truly changed from the humanity to the spiritual. We need both. That's really what I heard you saying, okay? We need both. But we have been given purposeful lives. In the goodness of God, in the kindness of God, we have been given that to share with those, whether it's hammering nails with Bob or whether it's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and teaching those who have come to say yes to Jesus. That is our purpose in life. Without faith in Christ, there is no goodness. There is no kindness. If we don't trust God in our own hearts, there is no goodness. There is no kindness whatsoever. With Christ, we are given, as without, versus without Christ, we are given the possibility to, to express the goodness like God in our being. We are given the possibility to express the kindness like God in our actions. And it comes down to this one thing, and that's this, is our work in all of this, because God's work is salvation, but our work is exercising it by submitting to him. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, as Paul is talking about suffering, excuse me, as Peter is talking about suffering of, as a Christian, he ends the whole passage by saying this most wonderful thing. Oh, by the way, in, in chapter 4, if I remember right, um, it's also talking about sharing the gospel in such a way that um, we're not whacking people over the head with it. It ought to be done in a kind manner. It ought to be done in a loving manner. Anybody can yell at anybody. I could yell at you right now if I wanted to. It doesn't make it good. He says this in 1 Peter 419. Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. You know what the in doing what is right verb is? It comes from agathos, the word for good that only God has and that only we get because of Jesus. How does this happen? Ours is to submit to God, to entrust our, our, our very lives to him, even though things are not going good, to know him and the saving faith and to trust him now in a functional faith, to make it mobile and to take it mobile wherever we go. Kindness and goodness belong to the church. Do you understand that? They belong to the church because the Holy Spirit ought to be right here in our midst. He ought to be in each and every one of us who have said yes to Jesus. And we need to express both of those things. Let's pray. Father God, I understand uh, there's no way that I can share the depth of really what you're all about in this passage. But one of the things that I do know, Lord, is that you have empowered us to be able to live victorious lives. Help us, Lord, as we come to this time of dedication, personal dedication, when we come to this time 
of saying, okay, God, I'm going to entrust my life to you. Uh, I'm already a believer, but I, I'm going to submit to you, and I'm going to live out in an in a, in a, um, attitude of kindness and goodness to those around me. I'm going to care for them. And God, I ask that if there's anyone here who has not come to a place of saving knowledge um, in your son, that they, would, that they would come and be transformed, that they would say yes to you and then understand what it means to be able to have the goodness of God in the land of the living. Oh God, I thank you for that. Go before us now as we come to this time of decision. In the name of Jesus, amen.